Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to Think Compliance. Everything Compliance is the only podcast in compliance featuring the top roundtable of compliance commentators. It includes Mike Volkoff, founder of the Volkoff Law Group, Matt Kelly, founder and editor of Radical Compliance, Jonathan Armstrong, partner at Quartery Compliance, and Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitors with Affiliated Monitors. First, have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? As I have founded the Compliance Podcast Network, I'm always looking for new podcasts. If you have wanted to start a podcast but were at a loss as to how to do so, please listen to a message from today's sponsor, One Stone Creative. If you are enjoying this show, you might enjoy hosting your own. As an expert in your field, you have skills, knowledge, and insight that can help you expand your practice, meet new people, and create amazing content to share with the world. In as little as two hours a week, you can dramatically change how you promote, fill, and position your business, and One Stone Creative can show you how. Learn more at onestonecreative.net. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode with the full gang. This week, we start a special two-part series today with Mike Bolkoff talking about congressional investigations, how they occur, how you prepare, and how you testify, all in the context of the Michael Cohen investigation. Jay Rosen takes a look at companies and industries that have previously not received a lot of FCPA scrutiny and who may now be under such scrutiny by the Department of Justice. Next week, Matt Kelly talks about Elon Musk and the SEC, and Jonathan Armstrong weighs in on the UK Serious Fraud Office's decision not to prosecute individuals in Rolls-Royce and the GlaxoSmithKline corruption cases. All of the rants and shout-outs follow this week's episode. Michael Volkoff, you have worked uh, actually on uh, on the Hill at Congress in, uh, I believe it was the uh, House Judiciary Committee, and um, we had one of the most um, incredible hearings we've ever had uh, this week in front of the House, the House Select Committee, and I, of course, refer to Michael Cohen's testimony. Uh, frankly, I've not seen anything like it since John Dean testified uh, many years ago in the Watergate hearings. But I wanted to use that as really a springboard to help people understand uh, what is a congressional investigation and hearing? How do you prepare for it uh, as a client, as you as a lawyer advising a client? What should a, a witness expect? How does the committee itself go about preparing for a hearing? And then what actually happens at the hearing? So kind of with that context, uh, uh, what does it start with a subpoena or a friendly letter, or does someone say, "I want to go testify in front of Congress"? Well, it usually it, uh, usually starts Tom with uh, a quote unquote friendly letter, uh, and it's not very friendly. Um, you know, in these days, right now, with uh, the the risks for a congressional investigation, and I use investigation in quotes for congressional publicity uh, against a company are just huge right now. Um, and the reason is that the Democrats, uh, you know, are exercising obviously their oversight authority. And we had very little oversight for two years before that. Let's go back in history besides, obviously we all grew up on, uh, and the Watergate hearings and how dramatic those were, but from a company standpoint, think of the, and, and I guess this shows my age when, in the 90s when they had all the cigarette CEOs uh, up there taking the oath and uh, basically being able to establish that they lied under oath with regard to the link between cigarettes and uh, health cap- catastrophes. So um, for companies, there are huge risks. Right now, the drug companies are on the radar screen so you get these friendly, uh, in quotes, letters. Uh, very rarely do they have to issue a subpoena where somebody will not appear. Um, and then usually the lawyers who, you know, like myself, uh, work there or were former prosecutors like myself, uh, will represent them with the committee for purposes of uh, the upcoming hearing. And what's really fascinating about it, just from a professional standpoint, is it truly is like a three-dimensional chess game because what you have is a setup where 
you interact with the staff not like you would any other fact finder regulator in terms of uh, how you interact with them, making your witness available for a pre-appearance interview. The staff will conduct an on-the-record interview under oath of a, an individual, and they will try to you know, get good information from you so that they can then put you out in public. Their ultimate goal uh, for a hearing may be, you know, if it's anti-drug companies, to get you to take the Fifth Amendment. They love that more than anything, and we'll have a drama scene of you taking the Fifth, you know, your client taking the Fifth Amendment privilege in front of uh, the world, and they that to them is an ultimate goal. But the the overlay, which is really interesting, is imagine that you have a staff that's on your side and a staff that's against you. And they all do things in a bipartisan way. Supposedly, they have people in the same room. They don't share necessarily all the same information. And so there's uh, you have people who are giving information favorable to your side, to the staff that's on your side. And then there's a whole nother layer of members and who you have a relate, who your client may have a relationship with or they may have uh, offices within their district or state and their political interests that come into play. And that's the three-dimensional chess game that I talked about. Now, what is really critical is uh, having a lawyer, number one. I did have a client recently, a company, where the head of the company said, I don't have anything to hide, and I'm just going to go in there and answer their questions. Well, we, notwithstanding all the people telling this person to get a lawyer, he, he didn't, and he went in there. And I'll tell you one thing, uh, the old adage came to came to fruition, which is, you know, you represent yourself, you have a fool for a client. And uh, so th having a lawyer is really important in going through this and preparing just like you would any other inquiry for any other questioning, like a deposition, like a grand jury appearance is the same thing. But imagine now you have a political overlay. Imagine now they're just trying to get information from you that they can use politically uh, for sound bites, for moments in front of the cameras, for embarrassment, or for they're using you to make a case against somebody else. Uh, so you get in the middle of all of the politics. And that uh, that's just sort of the outside, you know, the sort of uh, macro perspective on these congressional investigations and the risks for companies. So we saw uh, in the hearings this week, Cohen actually produced documents at the hearing. I would assume that he would have produced the documents at this investigative phase. What's the uh, protocol around document production during a hearing? And we get uh, oftentimes the friendly request will start with documents, produce documents. And uh, then what's interesting is um, you will have several negotiating sessions about the scope of the document request, what the intent of the request is, and then you will um, uh, you can assert attorney-client privilege, but it is not necessarily as a matter of law recognized. And you can redact certain things for you know privacy interests and things like that, but you'll end up negotiating or discussing a lot of those issues. What happened here with Michael Cohen is. He brought his own documents. He attached them to his testimony. Um, so uh, I'm sure in the discussions they said, here are the topic areas, and we've seen that list of topic areas. And he went, as he said, and looked through his documents to find relevant corroboration. And uh, that was perhaps uh, no matter what, in any sort of fact-finding context, be it political, criminal, civil, when you have somebody who's alleging wrongdoing and depending upon the baggage that they bring to the table, uh, the amount of corroboration is critical. So documents turn out to be very, very important. And they, for example, will get emails, request emails, texts, all of those same things. So you have to, whatever document retention policy you have in your company, you have to obviously follow that. But here it was clear that he brought documents to because he knew he was obviously going to be accused of being a liar. Of course, he was lying on behalf of the president uh, for half of the time. And the other half, he lied for himself, obviously. Uh, but 
he uh, he knew what he was walking into, and he wanted to be able to say, "Here, I can corroborate this." I bet you he has more documents. And frankly, what's interesting about the documents is uh, the FBI has all those documents. They secured all of them. They gave them back to him. And then there was one member who was saying, oh, so you have these documents uh, and um, you uh, and never got into or allowed him to explain. Yeah, the FBI gave them back to me because they had already copied everything or had had everything and looked through it all. So um, and one member was particularly um how shall I say, uh, embarrassed or should have been, but, you know, didn't reflect it. You know what I mean? So, um, so that's how you deal with documents. And then usually what happens is the staff will do inner, you'll have an interview session with the staff, uh, both sides and it's under oath with a lawyer and, uh, that's, and they create a transcript of that. And, uh, so they have a court reporter there and, uh, you go through that type of thing. And it's more like, they're mining and, you know, finding out all the information they can so that they can then figure out what's the best way to use this witness to make our point at the hearing. So all the stuff that Michael Cohen talked about, he had already, you know, his lawyer, Lanny Davis, had already, they, he either had come up there and been interviewed, although I doubt it, um, but had given, the, the, uh, had given a pretty detailed recitation as to what he could talk about. So could we turn now to uh, you've talked about the the role of the staff uh, or, or some of the roles that the staff engages in. Do Is that really at the direction of the uh, chair of the committee? Is it the direction of the individual congressmen and congresswomen who are on the committee or is it something else? So you have a committee staff of Republicans and Democrats who work for the chairman and the ranking member, and they interact with each other all the time. Then you have uh, an individual committee, uh, you have a staff member for each uh, member of the uh, committee. So like a congressman will have one person who works on, uh, who briefs and helps the member on issues on that staff, on that committee. So there's really like a professional staff that is on the Republican and Democratic side, and they handle sort of all of the issues. Uh, the, the majority staff, they tend to, the resources tend to get split two thirds to the majority, one third to the minority. Uh, so you'll have, you know, more people on the majority side and fewer people on the minority side, but, you know, and then you'll have a meeting beforehand and you, you have a strategy. Each side comes up with their strategy and then they brief the members on their side They'll for, and when they say briefing the members, it's usually briefing the staff members or the individual members about the ultimate hearing. And then all the, you know, the questions and all of that, most members don't know what's going on. I always say that working on Capitol Hill is like, um, you know, the Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to the person behind the curtain. And um, most often they draft questions and statements. And that's why, for example, on the Republican side, and even the Democrats actually did a pretty good job of dividing it up so there was no repetition. Whereas the Republicans, you know, in the middle of the hearing after we've heard liar, liar, pants on fire, or a lengthy recitation of the person's crimes, the, the, the member is just reading what the staff member prepared for them and has no clue what has been going on. Even though if they were present, they could have listened and heard it. There's some members, on the other hand, who are extremely good questioners, very few of them these days, uh, and who will prepare and actually read materials in advance and come up with their own questions. I work for some members who are terrific questioners. Most members, however, will just read whatever you put in front of them and do it that way, you know, from the staff. So that's why you see what I think is uneven uh, questioning quality. And uh, it's like they're not really aware of what's going on. Uh, going back to the Watergate days, that didn't happen like that. Never did. In other words, each member had their own, had done work uh, and been briefed up to, for questioning because everything was on TV. And they were really, it was a different kind of story. Same with like important hearings like, you know, impeachment hearings uh, when they had witnesses. 
things like that. People would prepare for those knowing how important those are. So that uh, really uh, leads to uh, the next area I wanted to explore a little bit more in depth. We saw really a wide variety of questioning from the, um, I don't know what you would call it, perhaps um, comical of liar, liar, pants on fire to uh, some in-depth, very specific questioning um, as well. So uh, does, a uh, and Jim Jordan, I think, stood out certainly on the GOP side for his attacks. Uh, is there a coordination of strategy amongst the parties that one person will be the designated attack or and others will defer to him or her? Yeah, that happened in this case, uh, although I didn't think it worked very well. The, you know, you would like, I guess the general strateg- strategy on the Republican side was ask a few questions. And if you have any time left, send it back to Jordan and Jordan will, you know, pounce. Um uh, Jordan got off to a bad start, uh, and I won't bore you with the procedure, but there he was trying to uh, delay the hearing, and he for, made a, a, a procedural mistake, and the, the chairperson just sort of refused to let him fix it. So, um, uh, But Jordan uh, was, was okay. I, I mean, I, here, here was my general sense, Tom, and I, uh, you know, in terms of the strategy, and usually the Republicans were, uh, they had a strategy, and it, they were fairly disciplined about it. But in the end, I think they overreacted to the substance. Um, for example, they could have, um, they could have engaged on some of the facts and probably um, scored some points. Uh, for example, uh, Michael Cohen says there's nothing about he knows nothing about collusion, but has suspicions. Well, they should they could have made that point over uh, instead of just saying liar, liar, pants on fire. Everybody knows he's a liar. He came in there saying he's a liar. There's no earth shattering amount of it, and no matter how you go through it, he's going to admit it. So you can pepper sort of the the questioning of him that way, but uh, substantive. What I, the other thing I would have done is taken any instance where he talks about it and isolate the fact that there is no corroboration, or there are other witnesses. Uh, there is no corroboration for something that he's saying, um, and uh, at least that he knows of at this point, and so that it's just his word as to something occurring, and um, and I thought. They could have done that. So by it got a little repetitive. And frankly, I think people just sort of turned off, whereas the Democrats, I thought, had divided up substance. And, you know, some of them got into some uh, issues and there were some disclosures that came about that people weren't expecting. Um, And I thought that was pretty well done uh, by some of the Democrats. Um, but, you know, it became political theater in, in that sense. But what's very clear, there are two principles that are very, very clear. One is uh, it's always difficult to put up a cooperating witness who's pled guilty and is agreeing to tell the truth for in hopes of um, uh, in hopes of getting a lower sentence. People just are naturally suspect of a person like that. On the other hand, the the fact that what made Cohen more believable was that there were some er- – the most important thing a cooperator can do is say, I don't know. Uh, and when he said, I don't know, I have my suspicions about the Russia thing, that made him much more believable. Because if he's going to lie, you might as well lie about the whole thing, or you might as well lie. Or he didn't ever spin things so much uh, to his advantage in terms of the factual instance. Now, he defended himself and his integrity and his personality. and. I didn't think that that was overboard. Uh, I usually would tell cooperators, whatever you do, do not get mad on the stand because people don't like that. But he impo- but the relevant point here now is what corroborates what he's saying. And the first question that comes up is there's a lot of this stuff that happened with people around him in the Trump organization. This guy, Weisselberg. Uh, I love the guy's name, Matthew Calamari. I mean, that's, you know, that guy has to be called as a witness just for the name alone. Um, and uh, and it turns out he's just a bouncer, you know. So, uh, but people like that, those, that to me is the really relevant point. 
the fact when he overheard the the uh, Roger Stone reporting the WikiLeaks dump uh, to uh, Donald Trump in his office, and he's sitting there with the speakerphone on. Well, there, uh, you know, I would bring in uh, Donald Trump's uh, executive assistant, who's right outside. And what did she hear? Let's also look at the phone records and corroborate. Did Stone call him at any time, you know, from a phone that we know of? There's lots of ways here that investigators are going to go out and try to corroborate this. And I'm sure uh, the Mueller team has already done that. Uh, And now the House has to try to do it, the House investigators. And they'll do it. Trust me, they have the resources and the time to go out and do it. So I think what we're going to see is a corroboration attempt We're going to see more witnesses come in, and you'd be surprised what executive assistants know outside the doors of a CEO. Um, They know a lot of things, usually. Mike, I'd like to direct your attention to one particular congresswoman who asked what I thought was a brilliant set of tactical questions, which set up perhaps another series of investigations, and that was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, I was uh, following the uh, proceedings on Twitter, and I think many people were expecting literal fireworks out of her, yet she asked an incredibly specific specific set of small, detailed questions about uh, not only tax returns, but tax evaluations for properties in the Trump uh, empire. And uh, I wondered – if you if you had any thoughts on on her questioning style, but also can you use one hearing to set up another? Absolutely, and frankly, that's what they were doing. That's what the Democrats were doing was creating issues to follow up, and uh, and I thought the valuation questions are really interesting, and frankly, uh, I, I mean I know we're all focused on the headlines, but. Um, there's two things that are really, uh, to me, are follow-ups. One is the financial statements that he had that were submitted to Deutsche Bank, at least on one occasion, to get a loan. And I think uh, Trump has close to a billion dollars, or at one time had close to a billion dollars in loans from Deutsche Bank. And uh, on these financial records, which were also used to be given to Forbes magazine, and, um, you know, to help create his image that he's a billionaire, that uh, and it, what was interesting about what uh, Michael Cohen said under the questioning from uh, uh, AOC, I'll call her, uh, was that he said, uh, you know, I, I believe these are inflated. Yes. Uh, but he didn't go through any specifics. But um, some people subsequently have. And uh, so, for example, the. Um, valuation of a piece of property um, in Westchester, uh, which uh, which in his disclosure form he listed as worth twenty five to fifty million in the in this financial statement that was given to the bank, he valued it at two hundred ninety one million. So um, there's no way that uh, you know it was two hundred ninety one million. Uh, so they were. That's just the tip of a, the iceberg. So we could have, for example, bank fraud with regard to uh, inflated assets given to Deutsche Bank. But they're all they also were used. This material was used uh, to um, for insurance purposes to lower his premium and his ability to pay on premiums for uh, you know various business insurance policies. And she got all of this out in her questioning as to the use of these materials. And frankly, she, I mean, she, she had a nose for the jugular. I read something later. She never went to law school. She couldn't afford it, or she didn't think it would be worth it to incur the debts. But I thought her questioning was actually pretty, um, you know, she was pretty tough. And I think she knew exactly what she was setting up for the future. So I thought, her, uh, frankly, I thought the questioning fr- on the Democratic side was the best from the junior members, you know, the new members. Uh, there was a Ms. Miller who was really good, and then there was uh, several other people who were really good, and they were all women, and they were all prepared, and they asked very precise questions. Now, 
um, I, to me, it showed that they had done some homework. Uh, and it wasn't that they were staff prepared. I bet you they themselves read through materials and prepared. So it was pretty, that was probably the most impressive part. I thought Mr. Connolly's questioning from Virginia was terrific because he brought out another issue. Uh, it was well done and prepared. There was a gentleman from either Michigan or California, I can't remember, who asked questions about other illegality that occurred in the, in the Trump organization. And that was well done. I mean, very well coordinated. Look, uh, whether or not you believe uh, Michael Cohen, the question is going to be, uh, you know, are uh, what corroboration and the further investigation that occurs, no matter what, it was dramatic, no matter what, uh, it was well done, uh, no matter what he, uh, knew exactly what he was doing and his lawyers, Lanny Davis, uh, absolutely well prepared, uh, for a theatrical event. And he did a pretty good job of it. I thought his most powerful moment was when he said to the Republicans, I used to, you guys are doing what I used to do, which is to lie for him and, um, you know, to be silly for him. And we're, you guys are all being silly for him. And, you know, unfortunately, people who do this end up like me, meaning you get caught and get in trouble. And I thought that was pretty poignant when he said that. All right. Okay, let's take a five second break. Then I'm going to ask you if you got a rant or a shout out. Wait a minute. I got to think. What, what? Oh, oh, I know what it is. Yeah. Okay. Mike Volkoff, do you have a rant or a shout out for us? So, Jay Rosen, uh, we had some interesting uh, announcements this week. Or, or rather commentary, I should say, about the Department of Justice enforcement of the FCPA. And uh, one one of the commentary suggested that the DOJ may be looking at industries that are not typically either thought of themselves as uh, targets uh, or potential high risk under the FCPA and or really had not really uh, implemented best practices compliance programs. Uh, what is your take on all this? Yeah, so uh, Tom, you're referring to a, an article that was on Law 360 that we're going to link to in the show notes, and it's called uh, Potential New FCPA Enforcement Targets Come Into Focus. And this is from our colleagues uh, David Shakin and Kurt Wolf at Troutman Sanders. And um, basically, they've done a, a pretty nice look at all these different areas uh, we have not traditionally been the hotbed of FCPA enforcement. So um, they start off with something near and dear to us since it's spring training, that there have been recent revelations of FCPA investigations into Major League Baseball, as well as statements from FCPA enforcement authorities that indicate that the DOJ and the SEC are employing an, an outside-the-box approach to FCPA uh, enforcement. And in remarks that were made in November of last year at a conference, the chief of the SEC's FCPA enforcement unit suggested that the agency is scrutinizing industries that are not traditional FCPA targets, noting that, quote, you are seeing some additional industries coming to the front as far as getting enforcement action and that there are other industries that perhaps haven't gotten as close a look in the past as they will in the future, end quote. And this increasing focus on non-traditional targets and industries will have important implications for organizations that either conduct business abroad, operate in foreign countries, or otherwise interact with foreign governments. Um, so for years, the story of FCPA enforcement, as we've chronicled, has been one of consistency. Year after year, you get the total number of actions that fall within a certain range. Many of the schemes bear similar characteristics, and the companies whose bribery scandals spill onto newspapers tend to pull in a few predictable industries like Tom's own oil and gas, manufacturing, life science, or the pharmaceutical industry. Well, now these are some of the new industries that we seem to see actions being brought. Uh, the first one are sports teams and leagues and sports bodies. They have drawn increasing regulatory scrutiny. Uh, what 
wasn't an FCPA case, but what we've covered before in the past was the whole FIFA scandal. And there are now some issues where uh, supposedly uh, baseball teams have been working with Latin American companies and getting them to backdate the uh, passports of players to make them appear younger than they really are and to help them uh, get bigger contracts when they come in to Major League Baseball. Next issue that they've pointed out are consulting and professional services firms. An investigative journalist recently profiled uh, McKinsey and Company, the global consulting firm, of hiring relatives of several high-ranking Saudi Arabian government officials at a time when the firm was advising Saudi Arabia's government on economic transformation issues. And if this uh, sounds a little bit like the princelings and the sun, and daughters. It's the same issue at hand. Next bucket that they're looking at are colleges and universities. And U.S. colleges and universities often have extensive interaction with foreign governments and foreign schools, students, and faculties. And this comes through either exchange programs, visiting professor programs, or dual degrees. Uh, interactions with foreign education ministries or foreign foreign public universities, administrators and faculty could implicate the FCPA if gifts are hospitality. So, you know, for example, travel expenses to go to a conference or to come to look at a school, these could come into play as well as facilitating admissions or scholarships of relatives of foreign officials and such companies. Uh, donations and endowments also present bribery and corruption risks for colleges and university. And two more buckets that they highlighted were manufacturers and new entrants and the sale of industrial or commercial goods to foreign governments or agencies is always a subject of FCPA scrutiny, but the manufacturing industries or sectors that have become the focus of such investigations are a diverse and ever-changing lot. Uh, for example, U.S. companies opening or acquiring manufacturing facilities in Asia or Latin America that have not previously operated abroad may neglect FCPA compliance as they contend with a multitude of fees, permits, licenses, and other requirements that necessitate interaction. And an example that we saw in the news in the last couple of weeks was the Cognizant matter where uh, this CEO – and the chief legal officer took action to pay a bribe to get permitting going so they could move ahead. Uh, finally, looking at what lies ahead as anti-corruption compliance efforts continue to mature, traditional FCPA targets like multinational publicly traded companies and companies in highly regulated industries, the authors expect the mix of organizations, industries, and business practices that face FCPA scrutiny to continue to grow and to diversify. While there's no indication that FCPA enforcement will slow, the DOJ's FCPA unit continues to grow, and both the DOJ and SEC continue to prioritize identifying and prosecuting FCPA violations in coordination with their foreign counterparts. Therefore, non-traditional targets like we've just discussed, such as sports teams, leagues, sporting bodies, colleges, universities, consulting and professional services firms, and other organizations that interact with foreign government officials would be well advised to take a look at their anti-corruption programs. So uh, interesting stuff, again, and it's by uh, David Shakin and Kurt Wolf at Troutman Sanders. Jay, uh, does this really drive home from your perspective, having been in this uh, space for multiple years now, the need for every company who does business internationally to, um, one, have a compliance program in place, and two, if they haven't taken a look at it in some time, uh, to do so now in light of this new um, uh, information? Yeah, definitely, Tom. And, um, you know, as the world quote, or not quote, but as the world is becoming and they may not be publicly traded entities, they still fall under the um, auspices of the FCPA. So if you've got foreign or uh, non-U.S. members of your supply chain, uh, if you haven't looked at your um, 
ethics and compliance and code of conduct in the last three to five years. There's been much more cooperation on a global basis. So uh, it's probably worth some uh, time and whatever money you need to spend to get those uh, codes and training out and make sure that they are uh, giving your employees what they need to inoculate themselves from potentially bringing you into an FCPA violation. Jonathan, do you have something uh, for Jay? Yeah, I, I think Jay's uh, dead right from this side of the pond as well. It's things like programs and uh, and policies and procedures which will keep you on the right side. And uh, I guess just to uh, carry your theme through to illustrate it and to add a neat circular nation. Uh, circular notion to the podcast of course it was uh, uh, one of the elements of the rolls royce case was an educational trip to a new york university where chinese officials were uh, rolls royce spent about three million u.s dollars on a mini mba program for chinese officials to illustrate exactly what you've just said uh, jay this uh, had some fairly questionable elements to the MBA course, uh, such as a shopping trip to an outlet mall and studying in great depth the steak available in New York at the Peter Luger Steakhouse. So um, so I think that the authorities are definitely on to these fake education trips, and I, and I suspect we will see more of those cases. Uh, let's move on to rants. Well, mine's um, not so much as a rant, as a thank you, Val. Uh, and it's a thank you, Val, to the uh, Dutch authorities who seem all of a sudden to have got involved in uh, investigating corruption. And of course, the Dutch have appeared almost as second chair on some cases previously, but have perhaps not been known in the international community for the uh, alacrity or the determination to enforce their own anti-corruption legislation. But they're involved in two fairly significant investigations, it seems, at the moment. There have been raids in the last week or so in the Netherlands as part of the Odebrecht case that we've talked about before on these podcasts involving uh, cor corruption in Brazil. And it also seems that we can possibly expect uh, some announcements regarding Nigeria and oil soon from the Netherlands as well and and uh, possible uh, uh, investigation into oil companies that the Dutch are leading. So um, maybe this means that the um, the global G force against corruption just got a new member. <laughs> the global G force shout out. A uh, classic. <laughs> Matt Kelly. Yeah, well, I'm going to give a rave today uh, since really my segment was just almost a 15 minute rant against uh, Elon Musk. So my rave goes out to both Lyft and Uber Technologies, which uh, are going to be going public sometime this year. In fact, Lyft's IPO registration statement just became public today, and uh, spoiler alert, Lyft still loses a lot of money. Nonetheless, both Lyft and Uber have said that they are going to provide cash bonuses to at least some of their longtime drivers so that those drivers can buy those IPO shares at the list price. And if for those unfamiliar with the IPO system, you and I and other mere mortals, we do not pay the list price when a stock goes public. We pay the bounce price when it pops up by 20 points or something, and we hope that we'll get it dirt cheap and make a fortune, and we never do. Uh, that's why. The, the only people who pay the list price are the favored big investors from in, uh, connections with investment banks. They get it at the roadshow and whatnot. That is usually how it works. That is how Uber and Lyft could have let it work if they chose. They did not. They said, these drivers have done a lot for us and made a lot of people in corporate very wealthy. So uh, they are going to provide cash bonuses so the drivers can buy in at that much prized list price for IPO shares if they want. 
If they don't want to buy it, they still get to keep the cash. And even in some overseas markets where they might be prohibited from buying these shares, they will still get to keep that cash. Uh, so that is a very nice gesture. And uh, it is a, a nice magnanimous move to um, let all of the wealthy owners, investors, senior executives, uh, let them share with those people who really were the backbone of both these companies that made them what they are. So uh, kudos to them. Jay Rosen. So uh, this just came to mind when um, Matt was talking about Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. And uh, Mrs. Monitor has got me hooked on a new podcast called The Dropout. And it's from uh, ABC Radio and Nightline. And it basically um, takes a look at her obsession with Steve Jobs and wearing black turtlenecks and bringing over design folks to create, uh, you know, technology that won't even work. And from studying a fraud perspective, perspective, it's great how she brings all these people in and isolates them in a silo. And it's uh, just pretty addictive listening. So once again, it's called The Dropout. And uh, we can link to that in the show notes. But if you're looking for some uh, serial podcast entertainment to uh, occupy yourself in Los Angeles traffic, then this is one I'd recommend for you. Mike Volkoff, do you have a shout out for us? Well, I, I guess I, I would call it a in anticipation in anticipation shout out. Um, uh, the OFAC uh, and the uh, Segal Mandlaker, who I worked with at the Department of Justice recent last year at the end of last year, gave a good speech about how OFAC is going to put out guidance on effective compliance programs this year. Um, and hopefully sooner rather than later. But I think this could be really important because OFAC has become a big, uh, you know, enforcement risk these days. And uh, people are looking for more guidance in this area. But I have a feeling that they have a chance to sort of build on some of the concepts that have come out of the Department of Justice. So I'm really I was glad to see that. And I, I'm really, uh, you know, looking forward to whatever they put out, because I think all of us uh, here on the show are going to look at it take, uh, and see how it advances yet again the compliance message and the importance of compliance. This is Tom Fox. I hope you've enjoyed this part one of our special two-part episode of Cohen Testifies on Everything Compliance. The Everything Compliance gang is Michael Volkoff, Jay Rosen, Matt Kelly, and Jonathan Armstrong. I've linked to some of the materials they've discussed in the show notes, so it gives you some extra information to read if you're so inclined. I hope you'll join us again next week when we feature part two, which will have Matt Kelly talking about Elon Musk and the SEC, and Jonathan Armstrong will talk about the serious fraud office's dropping of its individual investigations against employees from both GlaxoSmithKline and Rolls-Royce, both companies who were found guilty or at least pled guilty or obtained a DPA for their bribery and corruption. This is Tom Fox. Everything Compliance is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.